Lord be with you. Good evening and welcome. Uh, today wraps up our, um, and tomorrow wraps up our, our three-week series on uh, Christian apologetics. Uh, three weeks ago, we started with Can the Bible Be Trusted? Last week, the problem of Christian suffering. Um, I- if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? And um, also, this week, uh, the problem of c- Christian hypocrisy. Um, if the Christian faith is true, why is there so much hypocrisy in the church? Uh, tomorrow, in between services, the, the topic is uh, the comparative religions. So I hope you can join us uh, for that. Uh, all kinds of helpful stuff in the bulletin. Uh, something's not right with the microphone. <laughs> I'll go change the battery. Um, and uh, opening song, Your Love, O Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall our offspring and our name, from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before the Lord. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, 
nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every child whom he receives. Loving Father, we are by nature sinful and unclean. Though we deserve nothing but death for our sins, in your mercy you have given your Son to die for us. For Jesus' sake, please forgive us. Open our hearts to the freedom of life in your Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, we are not consumed because the Lord's compassion never fails. His mercies are new every morning, and great is God's faithfulness. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Jesus and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners and grant us your peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, the spirit to think and do always such things as are right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may be enabled by you to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of you, or God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. 
I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assemblies. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle comes from 1 John chapter 3. For this is the message that yet you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not like, be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because he owed his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the, the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By, his, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, for I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon? He makes the tyrants of our own age look like teddy bears. He was the worst. He was a real horror. When King Zedekiah of Israel rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, he had Zedekiah's eyes plucked out, which anyone could have thought of. But the master touch was just before this was done, he had Zedekiah's sons killed before him so that his blindness, in his blindness, he'd have that last sight, that last vision to live with the rest of his days. Nebuchadnezzar had a 90-foot tall idol made and plated with gold. He commanded everyone to grovel at its feet or else. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, faithful followers of Yahweh, they refused to play the part. So Nebuchadnezzar ordered them thrown into a fiery furnace. The king took a seat front and center to watch them roast. But that's not how it turned out. First, he could see there were four men in the furnace, not three, the fourth being an angel. Second, not even a hair on their beards was singed. Nebuchadnezzar was so taken by the miracle that he pardoned the men on the spot and proclaimed their God, Yahweh, to be the only true God. And then he went one step further. He issued a new law to the effect that from that day forward, anybody not treating Yahweh with the highest regard and respect was to be torn limb from limb. And then his house burned down in that order. Presumably, Yahweh was pleased by Nebuchadnezzar's conversion, right? But the old king still had a, a few rough edges to take care of. It was a work in progress. You and I are works in progress, too, in spite of our faith. Though we proclaim Christ, we still have some rough edges. The church is filled with immature and broken people who still have a long way to go emotionally, morally, spiritually, and that's just the clergy I'm talking about. As the saying goes, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. So as Lutherans, we have an expression, simi ustus epicater, which means we're saints and sinners simultaneously. Our character can and should improve as Christians over time, but we'll never be able to completely shake off the old sinful nature because it's who we are as human beings. It's, it's our very nature. I not only commit sin, I am a sinner. And here's the rub. People notice that about me. And they notice that about you. And they don't know anything about Christians being saints and sinners simultaneously. All they know is, here's a person who claims to follow Jesus, but doesn't look like he's following Jesus. They seem to work with the assumption that once a person becomes a Christian, they shouldn't be struggling with any kind of sin anymore. And so they say, the church is just full of hypocrites. 72% of people who don't go to church say one of the reasons is hypocrisy. 72%. Jesus said once to his followers, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your, to God, to your Father who is in heaven. But many are not seeing our good works and glorifying God. They're seeing our hypocrisy and instead distancing themselves from God and his church. As a Christian, you have a, a bullseye on your back. You're a walking target for this charge of hypocrisy. And every one of us does things to contribute to the charge. Perhaps then the first response to the one who charges the church with hypocrisy is to say, you know, you're right. There is hypocrisy in the church. And I, too, have been a hypocrite. I've not lived according to the standards I've lifted up. I've sinned against God and his commandments. We can say this because it's the truth. 
we can also say this because Jesus has forgiven us. We don't need to fear confessing sin because Jesus has covered over our sin with his righteousness. He's forgotten it, and he's the one who counts. But I think it's also important to note that there's a difference between being a sinner and being a hypocrite. Often those two words are used interchangeably, and that's wrong. The Bible says all people sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. So the church is full of sinners because the world is full of sinners. In fact, the church is the one place in the world where to become a member, you have to confess that I'm a poor, miserable sinner. We can stomach liars and thieves and murderers and addicts, but what we cannot stomach around here is the one who claims to be without sin. That one doesn't belong here. We don't want that one here. This place is for sinners and is full of sinners. But it's not really fair to say the church is full of hypocrites because we're not claiming to be anything other than sinners. Anyway, since when do people allow hypocrisy to determine their affiliation or their, their participation? Since there are hypocrites in Watertown, are you going to flee to Chicago to try to avoid them? Good luck with that. Since there are sinners and hypocrites who work for the Apple Corporation, are you going to give up your iPhones? Some doctors are quacks. Does that mean you're never going to see a doctor anymore? There are hypocrites among God's people. Does that mean you don't want to be a part of God's chosen people? For some, saying the church is full of hypocrites can be a cop-out. So long as the church is full of hypocrites, then I don't have to set the alarm on Sunday morning. I don't have to go to any meetings on Monday nights. I don't have to give away my hard-earned money or volunteer in the community. Meanwhile, all the good that Christians do is so recklessly swept away with the charge that they, you know, they're just all hypocrites. Moreover, one way people make themselves feel better about themselves is by tearing others down. In this way, everyone loves a hypocrite, and the more grievous the example, the better, because they can use them to excuse the smaller transgressions and, and assuage their own guilt. They build up a hypocrite's hall of shame, but they shouldn't think for a moment that that's going to improve their chances on the last day. As they say, God doesn't grade on a curve. Moreover, one of the most fundamental teachings of Christ is that we should take our eyes off the sin of others and concentrate on our own chronic need for forgiveness. In our gospel lesson, Jesus asks, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? One thing that feeds into the charge of hypocrisy is that not just anyone can be a member of, of this church, of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, for example. We exclude those who don't share the same confession of faith. And that just seems so wrong from the outside looking in. The prevailing attitude today is that faith communities should be completely inclusive. They shouldn't exclude anyone. Let's think about that for a moment. Imagine that one of the board members for the local LBGT community center announces, you know, I've been reading the Bible and praying a lot lately, and I no longer believe homosexuality is God-pleasing. As the weeks go by, he persists in that assertion on the board, making that assertion on the board, or imagine it goes the other way around. Imagine that a board member for the Alliance Against Same-Sex Marriage announces, I've discovered my son is gay and I've changed my mind and believe he has the right to marry his partner. No matter how personally gracious and flexible the members of each group is, the day will come when the board will say, you're going to have to resign and step down because you don't share a common commitment with us. 
The first of these communities, the LBGT board, has the reputation, at least, for being inclusive, and the second for being exclusive, but in practice, they, they're both operating in the similar ways. Each of those communities has boundaries that will include some and exclude others. Neither community is being narrow or hypocritical. They're just being a community. We should criticize Christians when they are condemning and being ungracious toward unbelievers, but we should not criticize churches when they maintain standards for membership in accord with their beliefs. Because every community does. Everyone. Show up with a Big Mac at a meeting that advocates a meatless diet out of respect for animals, and you'll be excluded. Show up as a member of a gun control meeting with a pistol on your right hip, and they'll ask you to hand in your keys and your membership card. Show up with a Feel the Burn poster at a Trump rally, and you might get some quizzical looks. Similarly, take your newborn infant to a non-denominational church and ask them to baptize, not dedicate, but to baptize your infant, and they'll say, no thanks. We don't do that around here. They're not being exclusive. They're just being true to their beliefs. In the same way, come here and say, you know, I really don't believe that that's really the body and blood of the Lord. It's just a symbol. That's all it is, just a symbol. And I'll ask you to refrain from receiving communion. I'm not being mean or exclusive. I'm just trying to be true to our beliefs. What also feeds into the charge of hypocrisy is the idea that religion always leads to violence. We're still being condemned for the Crusades, right? Though I'm not sure what you and I, as Lutherans, in Watertown in 2016, I'm not sure what you and I had anything to do with the Crusades. But the point people like to make is religion inevitably leads to war, violence, oppression of minorities. There are problems with this view. Think about the communist regimes in Russia and Cambodia and China. They rejected all religion, all belief in God. They were devoutly secular societies, yet each produced massive amounts of violence against their own people without the influence of religion. Violence done in the name of Christianity, it's a terrible reality, and there's no excusing it. In the 20th century, however, violence was inspired as much by secularism as by religion. Societies that rid themselves of all religion in the 20th century were just as oppressive and violent as societies that were steeped in religion. We can only conclude that there's some violent impulse so deeply rooted in the human heart that it expresses itself regardless of whether the society is religious or irreligious. What about religious zealots or fanatics? Think of people you consider very religious in the worst ways, right? They're religiously overbearing, they're self-righteous, they're judgmental, insensitive, they're harsh. The problem is not that they're too Christian, but that they're not Christian enough. They're zealous and courageous, but not humble, not loving, not understanding, not compassionate or forgiving or wise as Christ was. They emulate the Jesus of the whips in the temple, but not the Jesus who says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. The antidote to fanatical Christians is not to tone down their faith or lock them up for hate speech, but rather to help them grasp a fuller and truer faith in Christ. 
people say, I trust and believe in Jesus. I just don't need to be a part of the church because it's just full of hypocrites. But Jesus says, you do need to be part of the church. You said you trust him. Do you trust him also on that? Jesus kept the Sabbath and commanded us to do so. He commanded us to gather together for worship. So who are you going to follow? The Jesus you say you trust or the proud impulse that says you don't need the hypocritical church in order to be a Christian? Those who call us hypocrites, could, could it also be that they are hypocrites? Anyone, anyone who lifts up a standard of ethics and then doesn't live according to them is a hypocrite. An example. Say a man, let's call him Robert, believes it's important that we all reduce our carbon footprint. So he reduces, he reuses, he recycles, he, he drives a Prius and buys local and organic and lives simply and politically advocates that others should do the same, that you all should do the same. But then he gets engaged and his fiance has always, always wanted to go to Hawaii for her honeymoon. Robert starts to think about that big fuel thirsty jet. And he thinks about his fiance. And he concludes he's built up some personal carbon credits and can afford to indulge. I'm not saying flying to Hawaii is wrong or sinful. It's just not living up to the standard of ethics that Robert espouses. So I think one way or another, we're all hypocrites. There's no avoiding it. That net is woven fine. Now here's the good news. Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians behave or have acted throughout history. Christianity stands on the sure foundation of who is Jesus Christ. Neither sinner nor hypocrite, just Savior. Absolutely pure and innocent, Lamb of God who went to the cross for us, we're saved by Christ's death on the cross not by the performance of Christians or the church. The sin and wickedness done by Christians does not negate or invalidate the Christian faith or Christ's redeeming death. We worship the perfect Christ, not imperfect Christians. Yes, there have been some really dark chapters in the history of the Christian church, and there's no excusing them. But the answer is not to abandon the Christian faith. The answer is to move to a fuller and deeper understanding of the one we follow and then cling to his grace for dear life. That is, when you fail to follow him, don't pretend that you didn't fail. Instead, run to the cross. Flee to the Savior who washes you clean with his blood. After all, it's his judgment of you that counts. The devil, the world, they always have, they always will label us as a bunch of sinners and hypocrites. That noise, I promise, is only going to get louder in the years to come. But their argument is with God, who has judged us innocent in Christ and has gathered us into his church and around this altar where he locates himself for us in, with, and under the bread and wine to cleanse us of our sins. So the church is a good place for hypocrites. It's a good place for liars, too, and thieves, and adulterers, and murderers, and misfits. Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick. It's not the self-righteous who need the church, but sinners. The church is just full of hypocrites, maybe so. But we're always glad to move over and make room for one more. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
we stand to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, back cover of your hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers, we pray for those who are ill, for Pastor John Zichlag, for Mary Reichert, Karen Kotitz, Wally Kurtz, recovering from surgery, Justin Mallow, for Chris Lundstrom, mother of Danielle Beely, diagnosed again uh, with cancer. We pray for our school at Good Shepherd, uh, which begins classes this Wednesday, as well as for all our schools in, in our community. Let us pray. As our God and Father in heaven has called us into his kingdom by the way of the cross, let us call upon his name through Jesus Christ, his son in the joyful confidence of his resurrection. For the whole Christian church on earth, that God would regard and care for his people in love as the Father deals with his sons, and that all who are called by his name would take up the cross in daily repentance, follow Jesus on his way in steadfast faith, and enter with him through the narrow door into everlasting life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the ministers of the word, that by their faithful preaching of the gospel, the glory of the Lord declared to, may be declared to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. For Barack, our president, the Congress, the United States, uh, for Scott, our governor, and all those uh, in authority, that God would grant them wisdom, integrity, skill in the exercise of their lawful duties so that justice be maintained the innocent defended wickedness restrained liberty upheld and consciences respected let us pray to the lord lord have for all those who are sick or suffering in various ways for john mary karen wally justin chris and those whom we name in our hearts that our God and Father in heaven would grant them health and strength in heart and mind, body and soul, that he would deliver them from all harm and danger and preserve them in peace under the protection of his holy angels. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the people of our land, especially those who rely upon sunshine and rain in due season, that our gracious God, the maker of the heavens and the earth would open his hand to sustain and satisfy his creatures and that he would defend and protect us from all calamity by fire and water from pestilence and drought from scarcity and famine and from every other evil let us pray to the lord lord have mercy for our schools in this community and for teachers for students that it would be a year of uh, safety, of good learning, 
where it is permitted of, of, of Christian virtues being taught and received well, and even more so, the good news of the gospel being voiced in, in ways that are winsome and effective. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For thankful hearts and lives of generous charity, that being grateful to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we would walk before the Lord with reverence and awe, abiding in his ways of holiness and righteousness all our days, and enjoy the testimony of a good conscience. Let us pray to, uh, to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the, of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.